In this lecture, we will review chest radiographic findings of pulmonary edema. Hydrostatic pulmonary edema can be classified as cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Cardiogenic edema is commonly due to left heart failure or mitral valve disease, while non-cardiogenic edema is most often the result of volume overload or renal failure. The mechanism of cardiogenic edema is illustrated on this slide. Left heart failure results in decreased cardiac output, which raises left atrial pressure. This pressure is transmitted in retrograde fashion to the pulmonary veins and ultimately increases pulmonary capillary pressure. We remember that fluid is retained in the intravascular space due to a delicate balance between the intravascular capillary and osmotic pressures and the surrounding pressures in the interstitial space. When capillary pressure increases or plasma colloid pressure decreases, the gradient favors movement of fluid from the capillaries into the interstitial space. Cardiogenic edema can be divided into three stages from least to most severe based on the degree of capillary pressure elevation. These are redistribution, interstitial edema, and alveolar edema. Redistribution is characterized by cephalization of pulmonary blood flow, distension of the pulmonary arteries and veins enlarging the hilar shadows, and an increased size of the pulmonary artery relative to the bronchus. This is pulmonary venous hypertension without interstitial edema, and in the acute heart failure setting, is typically associated with pulmonary capillary wedge pressures of 12 to 17 millimeters mercury. With increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, fluid transudates into the interstitial space, resulting in interstitial edema, manifesting as septal lines, parabronchial cuffing, and vascular indistinctness on chest radiographs. With continued increase in the capillary wedge pressures exceeding 25 millimeters of mercury, fluid moves from the interstitial space into the airspace, resulting in alveolar edema seen as perihilar or dependent bilateral symmetric airspace opacities on the chest x-ray. This is an example of the earliest stage of edema, redistribution. We can see dilated upper zone vessels known as cephalization, enlarged hilar shadows, and a vessel to bronchus ratio greater than one. The mantra, old films are your friends, is illustrated in this case. The changes of redistribution are subtle and more easily detected when a baseline exam is available for comparison. Here is that same case on the right next to the patient's baseline normal exam on the left. Chest radiologists often describe lung findings in relation to the secondary pulmonary lobule. It is the smallest unit of lung delimited by connective tissue septa and ranges in diameter from 1 to 2.5 centimeters in size. It is the unit of lung evaluated at HRCT. Relevant to our discussion today, pulmonary lymphatics are located around the central lobular core structures, the lobular bronchiole and arteriole, in the interlobular septa, and in the subpleural interstitium. When fluid transudates from the capillary to the interstitium, it fills the spaces illustrated in yellow, first resulting in smoothly thickened septal lines, also known as curly B lines. The findings of interstitial edema include widening of the vascular pedicle, reflecting distension of the superior vena cava, and increasing circulating blood volume. Distension of the azagous vein can be used as a manometer of the mediastinum. Fluid exiting the lymphatics into the interstitial space results in septal lines, parabronchial cuffing, and fissural thickening. With cardiogenic edema, the cardiac silhouette will often be enlarged, reflecting chamber dilation. Pleural effusions are frequently present as the lymphatics in the outer third of the lung drain to the pleural space. This patient presented to the emergency room with shortness of breath and vague chest discomfort after consuming a large bag of potato chips while watching the NFL playoffs. We see sternal wires and bypass graft markers indicating prior coronary artery bypass surgery. As you search for abnormalities, remember our mantra, old films are your friends. We see on this exam findings of expanded circulating blood volume, including widening of the vascular pedicle width and azagous distension. Additionally, septal thickening and parabronchial cuffing are present, characteristic findings of interstitial edema. There is a small right pleural effusion as well. On the lateral examination in a different patient, we can often identify fissural thickening, mistakenly referred to as fluid in the fissure. But is it really fluid in the fissure? If it was in the pleural potential space, shouldn't it follow a gravitational distribution? It is actually fluid in the subpleural interstitium, that is, on the side of the visceral pleura associated with the lung parenchyma. 
We can think of it as a septal line sandwiching the two layers of visceral pleura, the granddaddy of all curly lines. Here is a lateral chest radiograph and the corresponding sagittal CT scan. Note the thickened septal lines perpendicular to the thickened fissures, demonstrating the contiguity of the interstitial space filled with transudative fluid. Another characteristic feature of edema is rapid clearance after treatment. In this patient who presented with interstitial edema, there is rapid return to normal after administration of Lasix and associated diuresis. Let's return to our schematic representation of the secondary pulmonary lobule. With increased capillary pressure, the fluid transudate overwhelms the lymphatics and interstitial space, ultimately filling the alveolar space. Remember, this is a transudate and readily distributes in the air spaces based on position and gravity. This patient presented with an acute ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, and the chest radiograph reveals symmetric bilateral perihilar airspace opacity. There is also blunting of the right costophrenic angle consistent with a small pleural effusion. This perihilar airspace distribution has been termed a bat wing edema pattern, occurring with rapid increases in left sided cardiac pressure, often before the cardiac chambers have had time to dilate. This CT illustrates the exquisite gravity-dependent distribution of early alveolar edema. Remember, the patient is supine for a CT exam. Note the accompanying septal lines and fissural thickening of concomitant interstitial edema in the non-dependent lung. This patient presented with an alveolar edema pattern, which cleared rapidly after medical therapy and placement of an intraaortic balloon counterpulsation device. The inflation-deflation cycle of the intraaortic balloon functions to decrease afterload just prior to systole by deflating the balloon and to push blood back toward the heart to augment coronary artery perfusion by inflating the balloon in diastole. Let's look at several examples of non-cardiogenic edema. This is one of the few mnemonics that I like because it makes sense. Non-cardiogenic edema, the mnemonic is not cardiac, and it is a fairly comprehensive list of the myriad causes of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Here is a 19-year-old patient who presented with acute renal failure and non-cardiogenic edema. Note the widened vascular pedicle and distended azagous vein. There is bilateral symmetric airspace opacity and small pleural effusions with a normal-sized cardiac silhouette. The contrast chest CT in this same patient reveals a gravitational distribution of this alveolar edema with small bilateral pleural effusions. Note the interstitial edema with septal lines in the non-dependent portion of the lungs. This example is a 23-year-old woman who presented with septic shock and circulatory collapse due to meningococcemia. She required aggressive resuscitation with 11 liters of fluid to maintain her pressure, resulting in overhydration edema. There is a diffuse whiteout of both lungs with sparing of the costophrenic angles, a common feature of edema. As she responded to antibiotic therapy and diuresis, her chest radiograph rapidly cleared over a 24-hour period. Let's review one last extremely important concept. We've been discussing the manifestations of pulmonary edema and, in some instances, discussing the size of the heart. In practice, radiologists most often use the term enlargement of the cardiac silhouette. Why is that? It is important to remember other structures may contribute to the shadow besides the heart. Here's a PA and lateral chest x-ray in a patient at baseline. You can disregard the retained bullet fragment indicated by the arrow in the left chest soft tissues. Patient came back to the hospital with chest pain and this examination reveals an enlarged cardiac silhouette. Is it a large heart? Remember that the heart is enclosed in a pericardial sac that is generally so thin as to not contribute substantially to the size of the cardiac silhouette and is not seen as a separate structure at conventional radiography because it is soft tissue density and so is the myocardium. That is unless the space fills up with fluid, in which case the mediastinal fat and the epicardial fat become separated by a visible layer of fluid resulting in a laminar appearance on the lateral exam of fat fluid, and fat. This is the so-called epicardial fat stripe sign or Oreo cookie sign. So in this lecture we reviewed the two major categories of hydrostatic edema, the three stages of edema increasing in severity from stage 1, redistribution, stage 2, interstitial edema, 
and stage 3, alveolar edema. These stages roughly correlate with wedge pressure, and finally, we've just seen that an enlarged cardiac silhouette may be a big heart or adjacent structures, such as a pericardial effusion.